All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the virtual live Vermont Breakfast on the Farm at the Miller Farm. My name is Melissa Caribou. I'm a dairy nutritionist, which means I spend my days helping farmers choose healthy diets to feed to their cows. And I also volunteer my time at Vermont Breakfast on the Farm. Today on the tour, we have people, hundreds of people that I can see have signed on from all over the country, all over the world even, to visit the Miller Farm in Vernon, Vermont. I just have a few instructions for you all before we get started, and then we'll head off to the farm. First, this tour is being recorded, and the link will be sent to you after so that you can watch any parts that you missed or want to watch again after the tour. Second, we'll be using the polling feature throughout the tour to ask you questions and test the knowledge you're gaining um, during our virtual tour today. The polls will automatically open in a box, in a box um, over your Zoom window, and you can read the question, select the answer, and submit it to participate in our poll. Third, your webcams and microphones will not be used during the tour today. However, we would love to have as many questions from you um, as you guys can think of. You can submit a question by clicking on the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window and type the question and submit it. We'll answer as many questions live as we have time for, but we also have people from the Breakfast on the Farm Committee and from the Miller Farm family that will be typing the answers to the questions that we don't have time to answer live. Lastly, we also received hundreds of questions from uh, the registration process, and we'll be selecting a few of those to answer live on the tour as well today. So with that, thank you everyone from jo for joining, and we're gonna head off to the farm. Take it away, Keith and Art. Thanks so much, Thanks Melissa. So much. Really appreciate it. And we'd really like to thank everybody who's tuned in today. I'm Art Miller. This is my brother, Pete, and along with Keith Franklin. The three of us are partners here at uh, Miller Farm. Of course, Pete and I grew up here. It's a typical family farm. It's been in the family since 1916. My great-grandfather, Arthur Lyman Miller, whom I'm named after, bought the farm along with his wife, Ethel, and moved here from Brattleboro. Our farm, obviously, you can see the cows behind us. They're registered Holsteins. We've been registered uh, since early on in the registry process. Of course, Holstein Friesian is headquartered here in Brattleboro. So we like to believe that we're the oldest or longest continuously registered Holstein farm in the world. And we've never had anybody challenge us on that yet. So I think we're good. Uh, we own about 300 acres here in the Connecticut River Valley, southeast Vermont. We also lease another 300 acres. So we manage about 600 acres altogether here at our farm. Our cows, as I mentioned, are registered Holsteins and we milk three times a day. Uh, they currently are giving about 90 pounds a day, uh, which is good for us because we've just started the three times a day. And uh, we'll get more into the cows a little bit in a few minutes, uh, but it is a family farm. Uh, I'm my son, milked with my dad this morning for quite a while. And that's uh, a big reason why we're here. We love the family component. My brother Pete's daughter, Abby, works with him in the milk processing plant. And Keith's had, uh, he has one son that works here full-time, another that works here part-time as well. So Keith, is there anything else you'd like to add as far as kind of a general overview for us here on the farm as we get started today? Yeah, you can go ahead and unmute yourself, Keith. Okay, okay. Uh, the only thing that I can think of is that we've been an organic farm um, since 2007, eight, we got transitioned. Um, we've been with Stonyfield since 2016. Um, we'll go over what it means to be uh, organic as we go along, but, uh, it's just, uh, it's been a good thing for us. And we're gonna wander over here and show you some of the feed that we feed to our cows. Um, our, we, we feed a TMR ration, and that means that we take a bunch of different products and we put them in a mixer and mix them all up. That helps so the cows can't sort out their favorite things. They have to eat it all. Um, here in these five gallon buckets, we're gonna show you some of the commodities, that's what we call the grain that we buy. This is a soybean based 
grain. It has minerals and vitamins in it along with the soybeans. Um, this is a high protein mix. And so we feed that to the cows. Um, our nutritionist helps us to figure out how many pounds that we should feed. And then we have in this bucket here is corn meal. And that's just corn that's ground up fine, very similar to what um, you'd use for cooking. But this is, this is cow feed. And then we have here, this is what we call baleage. We uh, feed baleage or we do feed a haylage. And baleage is hay that's been run through a baler and it's what you see with the white marshmallows. We stick it in the plastic, and uh, that helps it to ferment and uh, keep throughout the year. And we take and put it in the mixer and grind it up. Now, behind us here is the big corn pile. And this is corn silage that is uh, the whole plant. We chop everything from the tassels to the silk to the corn kernels. The cob is all chopped up there. And you can see the kernels, maybe, are um, all pounded up. The chopper goes through and it cuts those all into little pieces. And we mix that in. This is the main ingredient in our diet for our cows. And then over here is our mixer wagon. And think of your big stand mixer in your house. Um, it has a big screw in there that goes around and spins all these ingredients together. And this pile of feed here is what all of that stuff mixed up looks like. And this is what the cows will get and eat. And like I say, see, it's made so that they can't sort it out. Every mouthful has a little bit of everything in it. So that's, that's what we feed cows. So we're gonna wander in and uh, start showing you some of our cows close up. And we're gonna have Pete, when we get there, is gonna start talking about how we identify our cows. So while you guys are walking, we're going to start with the first poll question. The question is, what crops below do cows eat? A, haylage, which is fermented grasses. B, corn silage, which is fermented corn stalks. C, grain with added vitamins and minerals. D, grass while grazing in the pasture. Or E, all of the above. And while we're waiting for the answers to come in for the poll, Keith, we have a question live from Eleanor. She would like to know, uh, why do we want the crops to ferment? Uh, the biggest reason we want the crops to ferment, because if we had fresh feed, it would just spoil and mildew. So putting it in a pile or putting it in a bag or in the bales and keeping it packed tight and letting it cure and ferment, it makes it just so we can store it. It's kind of like us taking a, a fresh vegetable crop and freezing it or canning it, it does the same thing, just allows it to last throughout the year. Because here, here then, in Vermont, we'll take one more um, question. Here in Vermont, about... we don't get a bunch of, sorry, um, we don't get green grass year round and we need to have, you know, a way to feed the cows every day throughout the year. Awesome. Thanks, Keith. Uh, one more question from Megan. She's wondering how much does a cow eat every day? Our cows are eating about 100 pounds every day of that mix that we just showed you. Um, so it's a lot of feed that a cow has to have to maintain her body and to maintain the milk. Great, so just to finish up on the poll, the answer was E, all of the above. And we'll take it away now in the milking cow barn. Okay, so Wanted to talk about our animal ID, their ear tags a little bit. This cow here in their left ear, you'll see their name is on the bottom. Their birth date is the next number up. Their father uh, or sire is the name on the top. And then every cow, there's a big long number on their right ear tag and a number, a local uh, barn number we call it. Hers was 567. And she has a 003 with a whole bunch of other numbers for a national cow ID. Uh, so we can track her uh, for production and such. The cows are eating at, a, uh, at the feed bunk here, some of them. <clears throat> some of them are also lying down. And um, most of them, when they lie down, they do what they call ruminate. And they're chewing their cud. And um, that's uh, actually how they regurgitate and, and uh, re-chew their food. 
they have uh, their four stomachs that uh, they get uh, lots of microbial activity in. And so that's really good for a cow to be laying there happy. Great, uh, we have a question from Jessica. She's wondering how many cows do you have on the farm? We are milking about 185. Uh, we also have about 130 young stock in various stages from very young to uh, milking cows. Cool, and yeah, we'll be looking at some of those on the tour in a few minutes. Um, yes. Another question from Carl. Carl's from Essex Junction, Vermont, and he would like to know, how do you monitor the milk production of each cow? The milk production, um, uh, we test once a month with uh, DHIA. Uh, it's a test service that comes in and takes the ID of each cow and measures how much milk they produce, also what percent butter fat and protein and other solids are in the milk. We also monitor daily just by an experienced eye. You can look at the udder and tell how much a cow is given once, you, once you've been around, at least roughly. Cool. So uh, Laura has a question. Um, she says that you guys have a lot of cows. So do you know them? And um, do they have personalities? Yes, we know most every cow just by their face or their udder or just their body type. And yes, they all have personalities just like people. Some are introverts, some are very social, some are very hardworking, and some are a bit lazy. Cool. So another question from one more question from Jill. Um, she's wondering if your cows get to go outside and on pasture. Absolutely. Yes, our cows go out. Uh, it'll be the first to second week of May when the pastures are ready, and our cows will spend about 150 days on pasture, typically. Great, one more question from Jen. Um, she's wondering, what do you do to help make your farm environmentally friendly? We do everything we can. Um, essentially, the healthier the soils, the better they produce uh, quantity and quality. The higher quality forages help the cows produce more milk, makes the cows happier. And uh, so to be good stewards of the land is actually in our best interest. Also, we're involved with a program from Stonyfield called Open Team. And we're studying the impacts of our farming practices on carbon footprint and trying to reduce carbon footprints of all of our activities. Very cool. Um, if if you guys are good, we'll keep going with a few more questions. We're getting so many. Um, Rita is wondering, uh, what do you guys do to make sure the cows are treated humanely? Well, we do everything we can. It's very much like soil. Our desire is to have the happiest, most comfortable cows possible because a cow that's most comfortable produces the most milk. And so, very much like an educational system for kids. You want them to be in a safe, comfortable environment where they're free to learn. Cows need to be free to eat, free to drink, free to lie down, and uh, free to socialize the way that they feel best. And that's part of why we like the freestall barn that we are in, because the cows can move around as they please. Cool. So we're having a little trouble seeing your video, but we'll keep, oh, here you're back. We'll keep asking a few more questions. Um, Hope is wondering, how do cows keep warm when it's cold outside? Cows are actually more comfortable in cooler weather than we are. When it gets above about 70 degrees, they uh, start feeling hot. And so they can crowd together if they're cold but their stalls are bedded with dry shavings and that's pretty warm in winter. And uh, if they get really cold, they'll congregate, but that's usually when it's about 10 below. So it's not nearly as, as um, 
hard on them as you, we might think. Great. Uh, maybe we can see the baby calves. We do have your video back now. Okay. Okay. Keith, do you want to so, talk about nurse calves? Yes. So these are our, our youngest animals that we have on the farm. Um, we've uh, instituted what we call a nurse cow raising program for our calves. And what that means is these calves all get a surrogate mother that they nurse off. And um, we're going to be showing a video of that here in a second, and you'll be able to see how it works. But basically, we put in one cow for every three calves. And uh, if you didn't know it, a cow has four teats. So there's one extra teat on each cow. So I think we have enough in here we're putting three cows in here so there's probably nine calves i haven't counted them lately but something like that and uh so we'll run three cows in and they'll nurse and we do that every time we milk so three times a day these calves are fed and uh they are fed milk for the first two months of their life and then we start weaning them off and putting them onto solid feeds and uh they get the tmr they start getting water and uh just work on developing their their ruminant part of their system as a cow because when they're born they don't ruminate um you'll see this one here is chewing her cud but that's they something that they practice so and we like the same thing we just like them to be clean and dry and comfortable and that's what you're seeing here they're all happy for right now Wow, so um, Shirley has a question. She's wondering how many years can a, a dairy cow produce milk um, before she stops producing milk? Well, a dairy cow has to have a calf before she can produce milk. And then about every year, they have to have another calf. And that, so a cow goes through, after she's calved, we'll wait about 60 days before we get her pregnant again. And then She'll carry that calf, and then two months before she's going to have the calf, we'll give her a dry period. And we're going to talk about that a little bit well in here when we get closer to the dry cows. But they basically get a vacation for 60 days, and then they have their next calf. And uh, after they've had that calf, then they start milking again. And that can, that can go on for 8 or 10 years. Um, each cow is different in how long they'll produce. Um, a lot has to do with their reproduction, um, getting them bred back. If, if they don't breed, it's hard to and not have a calf every year. There comes a time where it's not profitable to have them. But for the most part, we try to have older cows and keep them as long as possible. Awesome. So uh, question live from David. He's wondering, what do you do with the male calves? The male calves, um, we sell those off um a lot of the male calves go off to be raised um for the beef market they go into different places um a lot of ours are shipped off towards pennsylvania and like i say then they're they're made into steers and they're raised up until they're of uh age to make beef well, so another question from Dawn. Um, she's wondering about all these pregnancies and is wondering if you have bulls on the farm or how are we getting cows pregnant? Almost exclusively artificial insemination. That's been a good program for us because that enables us not just to uh, utilize the genes from the mother, but also from the breed as a whole. Uh, there's different, we use select sires who do does a lot of the testing, the genomic testing and the genetic testing. And so we get the best in the industry and it's easy to uh, improve your herd with artificial insemination. That means we breed them ourselves. The semen comes frozen in liquid nitrogen and we will try to mate up the, maybe some of the weaknesses we might see in the mother with some of the strengths that would have in a sire or in a bull. And uh, then hopefully we would have a, a good heifer calf that would continue to improve uh, the people within our herd. And so again, that's a good question. We try not to keep too many bulls around just kind of from a safety factor as well, but certainly for improving our herd, that's the best way to do it uh, is to bring in um, semen bulls from off of the farm. 
Great, so we'll go ahead with a poll question about baby calves. Um, the question is, how much does a baby calf weigh at birth? A, 110 to 130 pounds. B, 80 to 110 pounds. Or C, 40 to 70 pounds. So you can go ahead and select the answer to the question. And uh, while we're waiting for the answers to come in, uh, we'll ask another question here. Um, Kenneth is from Virgens, and he was wondering, are you utilizing any practices to improve the quality of the soil or to prevent soil erosion on your farm? Yeah, again, that's a good question. The, the more soil we keep on our farm, the better it is for us. Anything that leaves, we have to replace. And so uh, what we do is, uh, the one is uh, we could do use what's called a cover crop. You saw earlier in the video how we have corn silage. As an organic farm, that's a challenge. Not a lot of organic farms are able to grow corn. Uh, we are here, but once we take the corn off to a cover crop, it's usually winter rye is what we use. And so that's been a good um, practice that we've been able to implement. And so, yeah, certainly the winter rye, uh, the cover crop also, for us, uh, we try when we spread our manure, we try to incorporate that into the ground as soon as possible, because we find that we can preserve as most of the nutrients uh, from the manure, the, the faster we incorporate it into the soil. So an excellent question. Great. So we'll go ahead and finish the answer to that poll. Um, the answer to how much does a baby calf weigh at birth is between 80 and 110 pounds. So it seems like most people got that question right. Go ahead, guys, back to you at the farm. Okay, so here we're looking inside, we call it the Agway barn. And it's basically this barn is divided into two pens. The pen at the further end is heifers that are getting ready to be bred. The pen at this end is both of our dry cows and uh, heifers that are pregnant that are just about ready to give birth to a calf. You heard Keith allude to earlier the uh, dry cow period that we have. And so cows, again, in an ideal world, they give birth to their first calf at just shy of two years old. And at about between 60 and 80 days would be the first time that we would breed them. Again, we'd artificially inseminate, put, a, put some semen in a cow. If she gets pregnant, then at around 305 days, we will dry her off. And so we radically change her, her diet. We don't give them as much of the protein and the energy, the soy and the corn, again, that you saw earlier, but we'll give them more of a dry cow grain uh, that's tailored specifically for their needs during this period of their, their life. And the calf is growing really a lot, growing quickly these last two months inside the mother. And so we're no longer milking her, but we're, she's focusing entirely on raising that calf and getting ready for her next uh, lactation. And so again, this, this group that you're looking at right now is a mixture between heifers that are getting ready to have their first calf and dry cows that are on vacation from being in the milking herd. That's great. So um, another question um, from Melissa, she was wondering how has the COVID pandemic affected how farming is done on your farm? or how it's affected the dairy industry in general? I don't know there's a pandemic going on right now. Uh, COVID has affected the people, but not the cows so much. But specifically for our farm, it's had some uh, effect. The milk market changed dramatically with the pandemic. When the pandemic, especially the conventional herd herds that has affected them probably more so than ours. Our milk, again, we ship to Stonyfield yogurt. And so uh, when the pandemic hit our nation, people stopped going out to eat as much and people started eating at home more. And so the demand for yogurt has remained strong. And so the pandemic hasn't really affected us so much in that regard. However, it did tell us that the, the milk market is fragile 
And so we have started to bottle some of our own milk for sale uh, under our Miller Farm label. And so we've just uh, been doing that for about five months now. But again, as far as the farm operations day to day, it hasn't affected us much. Although when we do have two people milking in the parlor, uh, we do mask up as a general rule. But as far as uh, the, as a business, it really has not affected us as much as one might think. Certainly a lot of other businesses have been affected a lot more than we have been. Great, so uh, we have a fun question coming in here. If cows are naughty, do they get in trouble? <laughs> uh, a cow being naughty is when she tries to get out from outside of her pen. And so uh, cows do have personalities. They all do have their own unique personality, uh, but we like to try to keep them corralled if they're naughty, then they'll, they're escape artists. And then we have to do something management wise to get them back and contained again. Uh, so we, I don't know about how much trouble they would get in, except that we might put up another strand of fence or make the electric fence a little hotter. It's difficult to put a cow on timeout. That's right. <laughs> um, so we'll cue a poll question here um, about sustainability. True or false? The Miller Farm participates in a sustainability program with the goal of becoming carbon neutral by 2030. Is it A, true or B, false? And uh, while we're waiting for the answer to the poll question, uh, maybe we'll take one more question um, from Sarah. Sarah's wondering what you guys love most about your cows. What do we love most? Um, I love their personalities. Cows don't Cows hold grudges. Don't hold. They're very gentle and generous and giving. It's just really, and, and I know horse people love the smell of a horse, but I, I like the smell of a cow. And just the, the essence of a cow, there's just a lot of peace around a cow. They don't get their feathers ruffled. I remember 9-11, the cow, three cows gave birth that morning and they didn't know that there was a world catastrophe going on. They just simply uh, licked their babies and uh, went about their business. I love that. They're so stable and uh, just really settled me. Wow. Yeah, that's really, that's really wonderful. Um, so maybe along the same lines, Emily's wondering what is the most rewarding part of being a dairy farmer? Uh, the most rewarding part of being a dairy farmer for me is being outdoors all the time. I'm actually an engineer by training and I used to live in a cubicle. And when I stood up, I could see a window, but uh, now I get to be outdoors every day and uh, cold weather, hot weather. I, I, I like the variety. I like the fresh air, the sunshine. Cool. Um, so Keith I guess- could maybe answer we'll... that too. Yeah, Keith, do you wanna, uh, you'll have to unmute yourself. While you're doing that, um, we'll just recap. The answer to the poll question is true. The Miller Farm does participate in a sustainability program with the goal of becoming carbon neutral by 2030. And actually the dairy community in New England as a whole has the goal of being carbon neutral by 2050. So lots of exciting things coming for, for dairy. Um, Keith, do you wanna share your perspective? What's your most favorite part of being a dairy farmer? I think you might still be muted, Keith. Here, borrow my mic. All right. Um, my, babe, my most favorite part about being a dairy farmer is being outside, enjoying a beautiful day like we got today, um, and just being able to work around with nature and working with the cows and, you know, putting up a crop and seeing it succeed, you know, after we put the seed in the ground and when we get the harvest time, we've captured a really nice harvest. That, that's what's satisfying. Great. Well, why don't we step into the milking parlor? Um, sometimes we don't have great bandwidth in there. So we might go in quick and then come out while we play the milking video. Okay. So, so I think uh, you're gonna see him. Go oh, ahead. go ahead guys. So yeah, you're seeing our milking parlor. We're not able to go in there today because the reception apparently wasn't that good. But we do milk the cows, as mentioned, three times a day in a milking parlor. Our parlor milks 24 cows at a time. 
Uh, there's 12 on each side. So first we go through and we prep the cow. We dip them with an iodine-based pre-dip, uh, wiped with each with their individual towel. And then uh, each cow gets their own individual milking machine. As Keith mentioned, they each have four tits and we put the machine on there and the milk uh, comes through the clod, down the hose, gets filtered and put into a um, bulk tank where it is chilled. We try to have it chilled within say an hour after we're totally done milking. So you can see the machines retracting there after a cow is done, has given us her milk, the machine is automatically removed. When all 12 cows have been, are completely milked out, they're dipped again with a post dip and then they're released where they're free to wander back to the milking parlor or wander back to their main barn again. And so it actually, we milk approximately for a little over, it takes about two hours, maybe a little over two hours a day uh, per milking for us to milk the cows. And so again, cows are milked three times a day and uh, they actually enjoy being milked, I believe, because I think, you know, they're, they're made to create milk. And after they get so much in their udder, I believe it gets a relief for them uh, to actually be milked. They're, that's their purpose in life. They've been bred to give a lot of milk. And so uh, that's their job. And so they enjoy going to work for the most part. Great. So Brian um, has a question sort of along those lines. He's wondering, is, does it hurt when a cow is milked or what, what's, what does a cow feel? I think at first it's, it's an awkward, it's a new sensation for them, but no, it is not. They're not injured by milking. We try to be really gentle with our cows. Uh, we do not want to hurt them. The, the happier, healthier, more comfortable they are, the more productive they are. Happy cow is a productive cow. So I think now my brother is going to talk a little bit on the processing plant here. I'll give it over to Pete. So when the uh, pandemic hit, we heard about uh, interruptions in the national supply of food. And uh, we've often, let's be honest, we've often wanted to have our own product to sell and uh, and we enjoy the idea of sharing what we have with the community. And so we ended up getting a shipping container. This is uh, the building that we are in that came with the pasteurizer and the, a bottler, all the proper plumbing and the sinks and everything that are necessary for processing milk. We added this little entry and we get to sell some of our products right here in our little self-serve store. Um, so this is, this is our chocolate milk. We have a cream line product, which uh, the cream will separate to the top and the, the solids at the bottom. My favorite is the maple milk. This is uh, one gallon of maple syrup to every 25 gallons of milk. This is all pasteurized and then just our whole milk. And then we have it also in the grab and go pint size. We also sell in here Echo Farm from Hinsdale. They're friends of ours right across the river, Beth and Courtney Hodge. And then, of course, we uh, like to sell Stonyfield stuff because most of our milk does go to Stonyfield. And uh, we're very proud of that product as well. Great. So uh, we're going to do a quick poll question. Um, the question is How much milk does a cow make every day on the farm? Do they make one gallon per day? five gallons per day, 10 gallons per day, or 20 gallons per day. And while we're waiting for the answer to that question, um, can you maybe just share if we wanted to buy your milk, you know, where do we go? How, how do we find your milk, guys? So our milk is down here in the southeast in most of the little stores around here, the co-ops, and then uh, a lot of the little convenience stores. And we're also being distributed by Upper Valley currently. And um, they are taking us around into New Hampshire. And uh, apparently we're expanding down into Massachusetts here shortly. And uh, I'm not sure exactly where all the stores are, but uh, we are in a lot of little stores and uh, we don't sell a ton of milk yet, but uh, it's fun to see our product in various stores when we go around this part of the state and I, I guess probably a bit in the northern part of the state too. 
Great. So uh, we'll just recap the answer to the poll question. Oh, wow. You guys are great. Almost everyone got that question right. Cows make about 10 gallons of milk per day. So plenty of milk for uh, stony field to make into yogurt and for the millers to make into their delicious milk uh, right on the farm. I can't um, drink that much in a day. <laughs> that's a good challenge for any dairy farmer. Um, so we'll go ahead and show the video of the milk processing next. If you guys maybe want to explain what you do to process your milk. Okay. So we directly pump over milk from, this would be raw milk that you're seeing going into the pasteurizing vat. And uh, we pump it over uh, directly from the parlor, usually at the start of a milking. And then uh, we take and sample the milk and run a, what's called a Delvo test. Um, that ensures that there's no antibiotics in any product and uh, complete with controls. Milk is pasteurized in our system at, for whole milk, uh, unflavored at 145 degrees for 30 minutes. Flavored milks are 150 degrees for 30 minutes. Um, and uh, this is the, the Delvo process, the sampling and uh, running the tests. We, uh, while we hand label our bottles, so you'll see crooked labels. Um, I guess that's part of the artisanal effect. Um, and uh, once the milk is pasteurized for the full time, we will cool it in the vat down to just about bottling temperature. And then it goes through a heat exchanger with chilled water to get it down to refrigeration temperatures. This is my daughter, Abby. She's uh, filling bottles. I believe that's maple milk and um, like I said, it's my favorite. And uh, once that's uh, filled and we put it in crates and then we put it in the walk-in fridge. And um, I guess that's kind of the whole system. We have Linda there too. She's a local worker and it goes in our walk-in fridge where it's cooled. Milk is stored best cold. So between 32 and 36 degrees is a, is a favorite temperature for that. Also, a question coming in from Brandon. He's wondering, uh, how many gallons of milk do you process a day um, in your processing plant? I guess we, we're doing about 500 gallons a week. Some days we double batch. So I guess to add, you know, on an average, it would be about 100 gallons a day. So it's just a drop in the bucket compared to what we're sending to Stonyfield. But that's an important drop in the bucket for us because we're very proud of it. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, April also has a question. She wants to know what time do you milk your cows? Our milking times are about 4.15 in the morning, about 12.30 in the middle of the day, and then about 7.30 in the evening. And it takes a little over two hours, two and a half hours to actually get the milking done. Wow, so uh, a, a very common question we got on the registration is what time do the farmers get up in the morning? If you're getting up uh, that early to milk. Yeah, I think we're getting up at about 3.45. I think Keith's maybe 3.30. I see the mixer wagon going, his lights are going when I crawl, crawl out of bed. Wow, so uh, farming isn't a job where you get to sleep in very often, I guess. Not so often. We get every other weekend off. And so, but I don't think Keith really can sleep in more than about an hour, even on a, on his weekend off. He says he's staring at the ceiling and dreaming up what he's going to do next. Nice. Cool. So uh, another question from William, William's from Newport, Vermont, and he would like to know how and why did you choose the breed of dairy cows in your herd? Why did we choose the cows that we had? Well, that was kind of given to us. Um, our great grandfather, my brother in the intro mentioned Arthur Lyman Miller. He um, got some Holstein cows back in 1886 or seven, I believe. And it was kind of a club back then. And the registry was in Brattleboro. And uh, we've had them ever since. They made a lot of milk. And being as uh, old as we are, we decided that we would just stick with it. Awesome. Um, so 
Jan is wondering, has your farm been organic for all 105 years? Uh, probably about the first 50 and the last 12. <laughs> um, we, we were a conventional farm when we came back in 98. And, um, and then we ended up starting the transition in 05. And uh, we ended up shipping milk in either 08 or 09. I don't remember exactly which. Um, as an organic farm. Oh, wonderful. Um, Wendy would like to know, do you cow, do your cows have names and how do you choose them? They all have names. Um, it's whoever takes care of the calf gets to choose it usually. And um, some of the names are a little more creative than they, that, that, than humans would want for names, but they are, <laughs> they are names, you know. And sometimes we uh, have have a names that uh, reflect the times we're in. Like we have a bull named COVID. I think he was born about a year ago. Um, he's a mean bull. Actually, he's not mean <laughs> yet, but uh, that was a mean bug. Great. So um, uh, another question from Sherry. She's wondering, what are some of the inventions that have improved efficiency on dairy farms? Do you have your mic unmuted yet? He'll try. Wondering about inventions that have helped uh, on our dairy farms. Um, well, certainly tractors and all that sort of stuff. You online, Keith? I'm uh, not yet. No, here you get the headset. Now. All right, our little technical difficulty today. Um, for me, the things that we've done that have made life easier for us um, would be one of the big ones is <clears throat> our skid loader um, that took away us having to shovel a lot that does I mean we've got three of them and we put thousands of hours on each of them a year so you can imagine how many people that they replace um, and then our milking parlor that's another one with the inventation of uh, vacuum and pulsation and being able to one person milk multiple cows that really moved us ahead in what we could do. Um, you know, and just like Pete said, just, just equipment in general. Uh, you know, we've all got a cell phone. We hate them, but I don't know that we could live without them because they've made it so we can farm across many acres and be in touch with each other in a second's notice. That's great. Hey, I see there's a cow here and a lot of other people. Um, can you guys introduce the cow? And uh, I'm assuming this is the rest of your family. That is. We'll start with the cow because the cow's important. This is Icy. <clears throat> Icy is, this is Ella. This is one of my granddaughters. And this is one of her pet cows that she just loves dearly. Um, and then this is her mom, Kate, holding on to the halter with her. This is my wife, Tina. And then to my right, we have Pete's wife, Angela, his daughter, Abby. And then we have Judy, who is Art's wife. And uh, we just felt it was important to have our family come out. Uh, we have like 50 of us when we all get together. We didn't bring everybody. We just brought this group. I, I don't want to say they're the important ones, but they are very important, our wives especially. Uh, they have supported the three of us a lot over the last 20 years and couldn't have done this without their support. So thank you, ladies. Well, that's wonderful. It's definitely a family farm for sure. Um, so it's 1015. Um, I'm going to go over a few logistical things and maybe Keith and Art could uh, walk back over to look at the cows and we'll stay on for about 10 or 15 ad additional minutes to answer all the extra questions. We've had over a hundred questions come in today. Um, so of course, thanks everyone for participating in our virtual dairy farm. Everyone who attended today is going to get a link to a Stonyfield coupon um, in the email that you'll get that also will include the recording of the farm tour. You'll also be entered to win a year's supply of Stonyfield yogurt and other fun giveaways like cow stuffies, a water bottle, or yogurt for a month. And those winners will be announced on Wednesday, March 24th.
Also, it would be great if everyone could take our survey, which will pop up when you close Zoom. Um, if you take our survey, you'll be entered to win one of four Dakin Farm Breakfast on the Farm gift boxes. These boxes have pancake batter, bacon, Vermont maple syrup, everything you need to make a delicious breakfast for your family. The survey will be open through March 31st. Um, and we'd really like to know how we did so we can improve our farm tours in the future. Um, again, just a reminder, this tour was recorded and you will receive a link to the recording um, in just a few hours today um, so that you can go back and watch any parts of the tour that you may have missed. Uh, lastly, please follow Vermont Breakfast on the Farm and the Miller Farm on Facebook and Instagram. Um, we'd love to stay connected with all of you and to um, get information when we announce our in-person farm tours that we're hoping to have in 2021. So now we'll throw it back to the Miller Farm to answer any additional questions. We'll stay on for about 10 or 15 minutes for uh, those who would like to stay with us. So uh, now we'll take a question um, from Tommy. Tommy is two years old, our, maybe our youngest question asker today. And he would like to know what the cows eat for breakfast. Thank you, Tommy, for your question. And thank you certainly for watching us today. Uh, we like to think that cows do best on a boring diet. They eat the same thing for breakfast, for lunch, and for supper. And so earlier, Keith showed you the TMR. It's a mix of the corn silage, which is basically the corn stalk, if you know what corn is, and also grass, along with some grain, soybean, and protein for the protein cornmeal. It's all mixed together in what we call a total mixed ration or a TMR. And we feed that same meal to the cows four times a day actually right now. Uh, so they, hopefully each load is very consistent with one another. We find that if we change their diet much, uh, they, it takes them a while to adjust to the new diet. So the more consistent we can make their food, the happier they are. Oh, that's wonderful. Um... Jane has a question. She's wondering what your favorite season is on the farm. Oh, that's a, that's a great question. It is so difficult to answer though, because when we first put the cows out the first day of the year, they run around like kids getting out of school and you say, oh, spring is absolutely the best time of the year. But by the time fall comes around and you're because it's the best, spring's the best because the cows get to graze. By the time grazing is over, you're ready for it to be over because it's a lot of extra work. But we love all uh, We live in the seasons. We, you know, we're outdoors all the time. And so we like all the seasons. So I don't know if I have a favorite season. Uh, we certainly anticipate spring. We love summer with all its activity, fall with the harvest. But also in the winter, we don't have to do all the cropping work and going out and getting the cows from pasture. So it's perhaps a little bit quieter on the farm as well. So we like all the seasons here. We're glad that we live in Vermont. We don't like it when it's really, really cold though. That makes it difficult for us. But outside of really, really cold, farm is just a great life year round. Oh, that's wonderful. So we're gonna do, um, I think our final poll question quickly. There's still uh, over 400 uh, devices signed in now. So plenty of people here to participate. The question is, um, is true or false, a dry cow is an adult cow on her 60 day vacation from producing milk? Is the answer A, true or B, false? And while we wait for those answers to come in, uh, we'll take a question from Penny. Penny is wondering, um, do your cows receive any medication like antibiotics? So the answer to that is no antibiotics for our cows since we're organic unless they're gravely ill. Um, and uh, then if they got an antibiotic, they would need to be removed from our farm, potentially go to another farm. Medications, um, there are various things that we do as an organic farm, but certainly um, part of the organic standard is to um, not use conventional medicines the same, uh, you know, in the same way. They do get some vitamins and some various supplements. So it's hard to say, uh, there's that old uh, Greek philosopher, I don't remember which one, but said, let your food be your medicine. And so we try to do as much as we can as naturally as we can. 
Well, that's great. So uh, the answer to the poll question is true. Uh, dry cow is a cow on her 60 day vacation from producing milk and 93% of people got that question right. Good job. They're definitely learning a lot on the tour today. Um, another question uh, coming in, um, how old is a cow when she has her first calf? The age of a cow when she has her first calf is right about two years. Um, they're pretty much full grown. Uh, the other barn where we were at before, um, those cows were pretty much full grown and they were just about two years. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, so uh, obviously things are a little tough right now because of COVID, but people are wondering, can they visit farms? How do they learn more about farming? Can they visit farms? You know, we don't really have a, a vehicle for doing that at this point. We don't mind when people can pull over to the side of the road and watch the cows grazing. There, it is our desire. We, We've generally been very open to the public. In fact, we had a uh, Christmas drive through and a whole bunch of people came and saw our lights and we had a nativity set up and we had a, about 1200 people come through. We are very open to the public, but obviously due to the pandemic, we can't really interact with people right now. But uh, I expect within a year, we'll be able to do that again in a more free manner. Cool. So uh, Kathleen from Massachusetts, um, throwing it back to the very beginning of our tour, would like to know how does the quality of the grass or feed affect the milk produced by the cows? Um, the quality of the feed is obviously something we spend a lot of time on. For example, the timeliness of when we harvest it will affect how much protein levels are. In fact, uh, alfalfa harvested at the right time, if we are uh, each day past its peak protein, we'll lose 1% of the protein value of the final product. And so that means a, it's a really big deal. So when it comes to the prime time to harvest, we really try to do it if the weather permits. And then um, also we try to get it in at the right uh, moisture content, if it's too wet, the lacto-fermentation process doesn't work as well, and same if it's too dry. So the feed quality is, is a really big deal to farmers because it, it affects how much production you can get as well as how happy and healthy the cows are. Great, so another question coming in live from David. He's wondering, um, is there any way to capture methane from the cows or uh, reduce the greenhouse gas coming from cows? I don't know of any way to capture live methane coming out of a cow. It would be hard to chase them around and catch a burp. Um, we are working with Stonyfield to capture, um, well, to understand actually really uh, this whole carbon impact that we have. I think everybody on earth is trying to understand what the, let's face it, everybody's going to impact the environment one way or another and every creature is going to, but understanding how much impact relative to others, certain practices have, we're trying to put some real data behind that with this program that we're working with Stonyfield called Open Team. And it's across, it's across the industry. You should take a look on the internet and uh, track down this Open Team project that Stonyfield is taking part in. Oh, that's wonderful. So I think we'll just do one more question. Um, uh, Trixie would like to know how many people work at your farm? How many people work at our farm? We have about five full-time equivalents, but that's really a tough question because we have my 83-year-old dad that's uh, milking every morning a couple hours. He doesn't want any money anymore. And so, you know, is he working here? I don't know. Our wives aren't on the payroll, but they certainly help us a lot. So. Um, but about five people full-time equivalents here working. Great, and I guess we'll, we'll do a few more questions because they're still coming in quick. So Deborah would like to know what happens to a cow who is too old to produce milk? Okay, I'll let Keith answer that and I'll hand the headset to our 
So can you repeat the question again, just so I get it correct? Yeah, so Deborah would like to know what happens to cows when they're too old to produce milk? So when, we, when a cow gets too old to produce milk, we uh, do what's called beef them. We have a, a person that comes and picks them up and uh, they take them and they go into slaughter. And uh, most dairy cows are made into Hamburg. Um, they just, they are not a good, good enough quality to make prime steaks and stuff, but they make really good Hamburg. So that, that's what happens to our, our cows that are not able to produce. All right. Um, uh, another uh, question from Kavitha. She's wondering, what do farmers do during their free time? What do farmers do during their free time? Uh, you know, that can be a real challenge for us. Uh, it's hard to get large blocks of free time. But what's really neat about farming is there's so much we can do right here on the farm. Uh, if you watch this whole video, you may have seen a horse go by. We can do horse riding here. Uh, our farm borders the Connecticut River. So we often can go down and go boating for a while. As we mentioned, we manage about 600 acres. So we have lots of trails that we can both hike and bike on cross country ski. So while it's hard to get large blocks of time often, uh, we can catch an hour or two here and there. And we do a lot of our activities here um, right on the farm because it's such a beautiful place to live. So the challenge is, is sometimes we find ourselves after a while, we say, boy, I've been here a long time and I haven't gone anywhere. And so then we have to try to consciously make a decision to go do something else. But so again, a lot of our free time is spent uh, doing uh, recreational activities right here on the farm. Yeah, that's great. I think it's uh, so important to hear that because clearly farmers care a lot about their environment because on their free time, they like to get outside and enjoy the environment too. Um, so uh, another question, um, what is the most challenging part of being a dairy farmer? The most challenging part of being a dairy farmer. Uh, dairy farming is a grind. It's a, it's a, while it's a wonderful lifestyle, it's quite continuous. I mean, you heard people getting up at 3.30 in the morning. The guy that's getting up at 3.30, he got done last night at 9.30. Uh, fortunately, that's not every night because we try to rotate through that. But just, uh, it's a grind. You know, you, you go, again, somebody mentioned that we get every other weekend off. And so you'll work 12 days in a row, um, a lot of hours. And so just, and then there's always the uh, financial aspect uh, farming is, you know, there can be some good, some highs and also some lows financially. And if you're not careful, those lows can put you out of business. You hear how a lot of farms get forced out of business during a low cycle. Uh, when times are good, they can be very good on a farm financially. But when they're bad, they can be devastating because there's, we're in a global economy now. And so there's factors way outside of your farm that affect you significantly. For us in the dairy and or in the organic segment of the dairy industry right now. Uh, just the soybean coming out of India is significantly affecting us going forward. And so it's, you know, that wouldn't have happened, you know, 40 years ago, but that's the world we find ourselves in today. So certainly a lot of factors that are outside of your control. Um, it's challenging because you can't manage those. And so you're just trying to be prepared for what's, what might be around the next corner is, is a real challenge. So uh, another question from Jim. Um, he said that he recently read about seaweed being fed to cows to help reduce the methane in their burps. Um, have you seen anything like that coming uh, up to Vermont yet? Uh, we actually, I, I don't know if Annalise can show you this tub right here. We just recently in that blue tub have had kelp and we use it not, I don't know if there's any in there. I could get you a handful. Um, I'm not sure how much that helps with the, with the methane, um, but we certainly use it as kind of a mineral additive, uh, just again, to maybe help their digestion. So I would assume that anything that we can give a cow that would aid their digestion would be of benefit to that. Oh yeah, that's so cool. Um, so Rich would like to know, how do you get your cows in from pasture? How do we get our cows from pasture? We have to go get them. Uh, we. <laughs> We haven't trained our dogs. Uh, sometimes our kids get trained to go get them. But uh, we have to lock them out because they'll go out and uh, graze for a while. 
And then they might get bored and say, hey, it's time to come home while we might still want them to be out there. And so we'll leave a, pot, we call it poly wire. It's a little piece of strip of electric fence to lock them out. When we're ready for them to come back in, we'll unplug the fence because it is an electric fence and we'll open up that poly wire. And then they pretty much wander back to the room. You have to physically manually go get them. Uh, it's always, it seems romantic to send the wife on the horse or uh, the kid on the mini bike or something like that. But more often than not, it's us on foot going to get our cows. Yeah, good question. Get, get your steps in that day, I guess. Um, you know, you know, it's interesting so, you should say that. I know when I was running fence lines, we have, I don't know how many miles of fence line, maybe 30 or something, a lot. Uh, and I know once when I was running fence line, I did ha happen to look at my phone to see how many steps I'd had that day. It was right close to 30,000 steps. So we do get a lot of steps during the summertime running fence line. Oh, that's great. Um, so Susan would like to know, um, are any of the three of you former FFA members? And if you participated in that program, how did it help you in your career? Yeah, let me let Keith answer that. Uh, yes, I was an FFA member. I was um, here in the Brattleboro School and uh, was in the program for four years. I was the president of it in my senior year. It, it was a great asset for me. I mean, it, just just helping people to, to learn how to talk to people, learning how to uh, see how vocational agriculture worked. Um, we had a great advisor that exposed us to a lot of different parts of agriculture here in Vermont. And so it, it was a great program. I wish I could see it expanded so that more people could uh, participate in it. Great, and um, Keith, while you have the microphone, can you just explain what is FFA and if young people wanna get involved in agriculture, uh, how could they do that? Uh, I think they've changed the way FFA used to be. It used to stand for Future Farmers of America. Um, I think that's still behind it, but they've shortened the name to just FFA across the, um, the name. Uh, how people get involved in agriculture. They can find a farm that they can apprenticeship on and be involved in the care of the animal and the land. Um, go into a vocational uh, technical school after they get out of high school. Um, there's some really good programs there that will get you started. Uh, in the organic, there's an grazing apprenticeship that would get you out onto some farms and give you a chance to get your hands on and learn how to farm. Well, that's great. And another uh, really good one for younger elementary age kids would be 4-H. Um, do you guys do any, participate in any 4-H programs in your area? Uh, we do not participate any. Me and my wife ran a 4-H program when our kids were a lot younger. Um, basically just a very showing, um, we had some kids that came here that didn't farm, but had a chance to take the animals and take them to the local fair and show. And that really exposed about a dozen local kids to farming that had never had a chance to put their hands on a cow before. And, uh, and it built some real good relationships between me and my wife and those kids. Oh, well, that's great. Um, so Brooke has a question. Um, you know, she's wondering about we, you know, we've heard a lot about smaller family farms having a hard time in the in the current economic climate. Uh, why is it important to preserve the small family farms? Uh, why is it important? It, it helps to keep land open um, here in the state of Vermont. Tourism is such a big thing, but without open land, it, there's not a lot to see. And so farmers maintain a lot of public land for um, people to enjoy and to do some of the stuff on that they're coming to the state of Vermont to recreate on. And so, and then uh, it's nice to have families like ours. I mean, it's hard to tell what a small farm really is, but yeah, a lot of farms are family farms, but it's just important to keep families on farms. Yeah, that's great. Um, so Pam has a logistics question. 
Um, she'd like to know, how does your milk physically get to Stonyfield? Oh, that's a good one. We have a big milk tank truck that pulls in here every other day and it takes the milk that's in our bulk tanks. We have two bulk tanks that store the milk when it comes out of the cow and they pump it onto the truck and they deliver it to Stonyfield. And Stonyfield takes that milk about as soon as it's there, processes it and puts it into a yogurt carton. And that's the same for every farm across the country. Their milk is picked up every other day and delivered to a processor. And then uh, that milk is on the shelves within two or three days. So everything you're getting is very fresh. That's great. So uh, we'll do a fun question to wrap up. If maybe you guys could pass the mic and each take a turn answering this. Um, could you each tell us who your favorite cow is and what your favorite thing that um, you do in a day in farming? Okay, so we're gonna pass the mic around. They wanna know who our favorite cow is and what our favorite task is every day. Did I get that right? You got it, Keith. All right, uh, favorite cow. You're asking this on a bad day. <laughs> um, we had to put down one of our favorite cows this week. But one that you just met there, Izzy, that would be the daughter of Igloo. And Igloo is a, was one of our favorites. Um, so having Izzy around is great that we have that, that lineage to continue on. Um, these two here, they, they did a real surprise to me about a year ago now. I have a brown Swiss cow here. We didn't show her today. Um, that's probably my favorite cow at the moment that I have alive. Um, my dad enjoyed brown Swiss, and so it's something that I enjoy. And I'm thankful that these guys gave me the chance to have one in this black and white herd. Yeah, brown Swiss um, is another favorite breed of thing cow. to do today. Uh, favorite thing that I do. I, I really like working around equipment when I can get out and plow soil in the spring. That is one of my favorite tasks to do. Um, it just seems like the new new year turning over. I know the new year happens in January for me. It's more of a thing. So, and then on a daily basis, just watching the cows do what they do each and every day. So we'll let Art answer his part of it. Thank you. You know, it's a hard question to ask because there are so many cows on the farm. Um, but my favorite cow is River. She's a black cow, mostly black. And she's just such a strong, powerful cow. I've watched her from just a calf. She was a big calf and she's probably not our best. She is not our best producing cow, but she ha I've followed her throughout her life here and uh, she's doing a fine job. Um, but she, just because she's so big and strong. As far as my favorite task, uh, certainly if you're mowing grass, uh, like if there's a really good stand of alfalfa that's really tall and healthy and you're mowing it at the right time, uh, that's hard to beat. Um, we don't spend a lot of time, this, especially Pete and me on the tractors, because we may be more here on the track, on the chore end and uh, maybe more the office end as well. But certainly field work on a farm is hard to beat. Uh, we enjoy working out, doing chores though and working with each other though. It's just a great place to live, work together. So as far as my favorite cow, I'm gonna also uh, like Keith be a little posthumous. We had a cow about 10 years ago named Whidbey. And uh, she was just a beautiful, great, big, powerful cow. Very great disposition. And uh, she was just a fantastic animal. And my heart was really knit with hers. And, um, and I, I don't know that I've ever been tied to a cow more before or since, but uh, anyway, as far as favorite tasks, I do truly like the variety. Um, on any given day, I might be wiring, I might be uh, welding, I might be on a tractor, I might be shoveling, I might be doctoring a cow or trying to get a new calf out, uh, or maybe trying to work on a roof somewhere. It's just there's an endless supply of variety for somebody who's a little ADHD. And um, the mental challenge, the one thing I don't 
enjoy though that I do spend a lot of time doing is paperwork and uh, the books, the, the government uh, interventions, those are two edged swords, but uh, it's part of the necessary text of army. All right, so uh, we're gonna wrap up now, but uh, do you guys have any closing comments from the farm? Closing comments from the farm. There is just a lot of uh, value in agriculture of any type, whether you're organic, whether you're canola, whether you're a grain farmer, whether you're growing microgreens, we are just so grateful to be part of, of producers in this world rather than consumers. And um, I just absolutely love that we're able to produce a product and hand it to customers uh, with, with uh, our farm's label on it. That's just uh, one of the neatest things. I'll pass the mic over for their final comments here. Yeah, first off, for those who well, thank you with us for joining us uh hanging in there uh, as far as my final comments I, you know when i grew up we there was a guy named john denver who used to sing and one of his songs was thank god i'm a country boy and that resonated with me we we work such in harmony with the lord here because we're so dependent on weather on health safety protection and we're all just thankful to farmer obviously a career uh, to be able to work with my brother on a daily basis, you heard me say earlier, I was able to work with that and son this morning as well. Uh, what, a, what a rich heritage it is to, to be able to work the soil, to work with family, friends, uh, animals. Um, it's just a great life. And uh, again, just thank you for your support, whether it's through buying Stonyfield product or any dairy product, uh, Miller Milk, obviously, anytime you support uh, the industry, it's a blessing to us and uh, we just love being able to work together and live in the community that we do and be such an integral part of integral part of our world and our our in the future of it all right i just uh i agree with these guys completely everything that they've said um i want to say thank you to all of you that have watched us today and for the breakfast on the farm being willing to come down here to southern vermont and showcase our farm. Um, it means a lot to us. We, we think we have a slice of heaven here and it's just great to be able to share that with you. Um, I would hope that a lot of you would check this out on social media and you'll get a chance to see more about our farm there. And uh, again, just uh, thank you very much for following along. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for being willing to open up your farm, um, even virtually to the public. And uh, we really appreciated getting to know you today. So thank you very, very much. Um, so uh, just a quick reminder, um, when, the, when you close Zoom, a survey link will pop up and it would be wonderful if you could take the survey, you'll be entered to win a Dakin Farm gift basket and to help give us feedback and stay in touch with Breakfast on the Farm and the Miller Farm on social media. Thank you all and enjoy the rest of your beautiful Sunday.